Jewish Perspective. Hello and welcome to this edition of Paris Perspective. Today we're going to look into the evolution of the French language. Now, French was, one could say, given its birth certificate as an official language back in the year of 1539, when Francois I declared that French was to become the obligatory administrative and judicial language over Latin. Now, this marked a massive political shift for the French language, giving the common people, one could say, access to the workings of late medieval France. That was of course, if you could speak French. In this edition of Paris Perspective, I'm joined by linguist, author and specialist in France's regions, Mathieu Avanzi. You're welcome to the programme. Thank you. Hello. And we're going to discuss the dialects in France, their role in modern French and the political motivation behind the French language's evolution over the years. Now, starting back at the mid-16th century there, I'm bringing up uh, Francois I, that was the beginning Am I right in saying that the Parisian or Loire Valley dialect of French was then becoming what we now know as standard French? So that, uh, that, that was a, a key moment, one could say, in Parisian or Loire dialect French becoming the standard. But as French is an imported language in many of the regions, such as Brittany, Alsace, Occitanie, the Basque territories, this has given rise to a layered effect various layers, especially when it comes to the region's, you know, languages for food and the roots of their words when it comes to food. And indeed, you've just come out with a new book uh, called Come on Dine Chez Nous, How We Eat in Our Home or in Our Place. Um, now, this investigates the culinary evolution of words across the country. Tell us about the book quickly before we move on. Uh, like one of the great things, it, it just shows about the diversity of what, let's say, people in the north will call a pan au chocolat and people in the south will know as a chocolatina. This is the real basic one here. Uh, outside of France, everybody, I think, in Ireland and the UK knows it as a pan au chocolat. But why, where did chocolatine come from? So it's very recent word in the history of France, mm -hmm. and uh, from what we know or what we s the the hypothesis is that chocolatine was made on the word chocolate, and we use the suffix in that you can find in words such as gelatine or uh, other names that we use in patisserie, and it's actually super new. It comes from the fifties, the sixties, so you can understand that it's really a new word. So it it kind of just shows you that it just if one word comes to the fore. It all depends on if, whether it's picked up or whether it's dropped. Exactly. Actually, it will really depends on the, the people that they are using it. Yeah, exactly, whether it's picked up or not. And of course, in this book, which was one of the great things that uh, I, I loved about it, it's, a, it's, it's very interesting where everything is mapped out, all of the regions. It also gives the history behind dishes such as gratin dauphinois. So what exactly is the true story behind Gratin Dauphinois? Where did it come from? Who made it first? Actually, this was a specialty everywhere. People were eating potatoes with uh -huh. some cheese and some cream. And actually, there were uh, some people in Paris that mm -hmm. they put this recipe very famous. They decided that this recipe was famous. And Dauphiné doesn't come from the dolphin. It comes from the name of the region where they believe that the potatoes were coming. And actually, that's in Paris, they decided to call it Gratin Dauphinois, like Dauphinois, the, the way Dauphinois will make this gratin. But this is a pure invention from Paris. Oh, God. OK, <laughs> so for once, Paris can actually be the root of any of these uh, great culinary things that have been exported. Um, so now looking into the diversity um, of, well, of French and the dialects there. I remember, this is a little anecdote, uh, when I was learning French in the 1980s uh, down in Gascogne in Gascony, you could be in the classroom and you'd have on one side people with incredibly thick country accents and then on the other side it was if the, 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 the teenagers at the time had never left Paris. So, um, was that a social stratified thing? Do you think that there was a social comment being made there when people wanted to either hold on to their country roots or emulate 
the actors and the, the, the thinkers and the politicians in Paris. I call it the Charlotte Gainsbourg effect because all of the girls in the class wanted to be like Charlotte Gainsbourg. So was it a social thing, do you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's still going on now. You mm. can still see some students coming from the province and they arrive in Paris and they will start to lose their accent or they will say, no, when I go to my parents, I don't have this accent mm. because most of the people, you're right, they associate a strong accent with being a low, low class or uh, country people. So. Mm. And indeed, there's the, the one point that I always bring up is um, the French Prime Minister, Jean Castex, who, when he came to power a year ago to be the head of the government, when Macron uh, put him in charge of running the French government, he had a very pronounced southern accent. A year later, it's a lot watered down. So is there still a big prejudice in Paris against regional accents or is it getting better, do you think, in 2021? The, the, the fact that Jean Castex was nominated as the mm. function of prime minister was a very big, important thing in the, in the field of linguistics because mm. for the first time we were listening to a politician, which is a very high function, with a very strong accent. And I remember the first time I heard him on TV, I was, oh my God, this is the new prime minister. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this really marks a change in the in the mentality but of course then when you move in Paris you will have less and less accent because you are surrounded by people that they don't have accent mm -hmm. so exactly so it, it, it it's a natural progression that you will calm calm it down if you're not surrounded by the music of the accent itself now indeed accents all have their roots in the regional dialects that have their roots in the regional languages or the let's just say, the ebb and flow of people as they went through these areas. But let's look at regional languages, not the dialects, but the languages. Like, they have declined over the years, I mean, maybe beyond the point of no return. However, has that decline led to a renaissance in the use of colloquialisms, the use of uh, regional slang? Because I suppose it's easier and more accessible uh, for people to, you know, use regional slang rather than actually sit down and read and learn Breton or Occitan. So, I mean, how, is that is that has there been a resurgence in this? And also, how has social media um, worked when it comes to the propagation of dialects? Mm -hmm. I think social media is really the key because mm. most of the people they will want to have uh, to identify themselves as being coming from Toulouse mm. or from Marseille or something. And because they don't speak the dialect or the regional language, they will use some words to distinguish from other regions. And one easy way to do is to take in the in the in the common language, I mean in the in the root language. Sure. To, to, yeah, to create some new identity and to compare and to say, yeah, I'm from Marseille, I'm not from Toulouse and I'm not from Lyon and I'm not from Nantes. So there is as well this effect from the social media and you will be proud, you will just shake your words like you, you, you are in a battle for your uh, soccer team or something like this. Yes, regional identity is coming to the fore. Now, let's have a look at, um, look back at recent enough history and, well, it's, the infamous Académie Française. Uh, I mean, it was established back in 1635. And when you mention the Académie Française to people outside of France, they, go, they, think, they think it's like the Spanish Inquisition, but for linguistics. Uh, it's, it's, very, it's looked at as this repressive institution that constantly complains about the bastardization of the French language. But is that a fair assessment of the Académie Française? Does it have an actual function that isn't negative. Nowadays, you are right. I mean, they have a very negative function because mm. they think that the idea or their role is to defend the language, but they don't realize that language is evolving. So if you compare different edition of uh, the first dictionary of Academy, you can see that they were different because they were really following the flow, you know, yeah. and taking what they observe. And now you can see that it's a bunch of people that they just want to close or to stop the evolution. And uh, it's something that should change in the years. Yeah. So I'm I mean, the, the, when it comes to the Académie Française, uh, there was a little anecdote that I saw. It was like, uh, you can't be thinking of French as an old lady of language, because at one stage, France was a street girl, you know, that was learning its way around. I mean, France came from dialect. One could say, what is the difference between a dialect and a language? 
This is very difficult. I mean, this is a very, very hot question. It's a, it's a language has an army. That's basically yeah, it, yeah. isn't it? It's, 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 which one has wins is the one that has the bigger army, I suppose. But uh, at the end of the day, when it comes to the Académie Française, I mean, there are words that have come into the French language, even in the last 12 months, that they have to accept, like vaccinodrome. This was something that didn't exist a year ago because nobody knew how they were going to roll out vaccines against COVID-19. So these have been accepted. But with the, since the Academy's inception, the French language and the expansion of the French language has been deeply political. It's been a deeply political affair, especially since the revolution. Um, can you explain to us the importance of French in the eyes of revolutionaries at the time? Is it there was a, a percentage? I think it was is it only thirty percent or thirty five percent of France, when the Code Civil came out in eighteen o four, actually spoke French that we know today. So how important was France in uni, French in unifying unifying the country back then? Yeah, we there was this idea that French should be used to unify the country, and because we were creating republic. Mm -hmm the politicians were thinking, OK, everybody has to speak the same language and to avoid or to let aside the dialect because they remind too much about the history of Provence and the different divisions of France. So we always had this idea that came again in Jean-Michel Blanquer mm -hmm. during his uh, uh, work as a minister to say that there is only one language, there is only one French, one grammar, and mm -hmm. we should all speak this because the country will break up otherwise. Yes, and indeed, you can see even on the political map of France, there are no longer references to any of the old regions, such as the Basque country, Provence, well, Provence, yes, but it's, you know, the Grand Est is not Alsace. And also in your books, you re make reference to the fact that these things are a complete construct. They're not, they don't really reflect the real true roots of the French dialects is not right yeah yeah it's because actually this countries or this subdivision their boundary changed a lot in the in the years in the time and now it's very difficult to say well what is Savoie or what is Dauphiné for example exactly yes and now in in your book um, one of your books uh, Parlez-vous les Français do you speak the French languages because it's not just one um, Again, an atlas of regional expressions, uh, but it comes across as well in the book. One version of French isn't necessarily better than the other. It's just what you are used to in a standardised thing. But again, it comes back to the question of um, prejudice, uh, sophisticated French versus the spoken French in the regions. There was a word that came to the fore a few years ago called glottophobia. Is that something that we can still, that we still see out there? That is uh, something that we uh, that is coming very much um, back to bite us. Yeah, we can talk again about the prime minister when mm. he came. There were many reactions saying this guy should not be prime minister mm -hmm. because he's speaking like a stone or speaking like <laughs> a, uh, like a country guy, and he should not be speaking this way. So, mm -hmm. glottophobia is still something that we feel that we have, and I can see my students when they arrive from the province in Paris, and I tell them, "Ah, oh, but you come from Toulouse or you come from Strasbourg, but why you don't?" St articulate this way or this way because people are making fun of me when I come in Paris. Yes. And of the dialects that you've encountered, which one do you think is the richest etymologically? I mean, <laughs> we all, I think, you know, like when you think of Parisian standard French, we kind of say, oh, it's a bit dull. It's very flat. It's very homogenous. Um, but, you know, looking at more of the colourful phrases from around like, you know, neighbouring Belgium, where you've just come from today, over to Switzerland, to where you might be going very soon, what region do you think has the most colourful expressions in uh, in French dialect? It's, it's very difficult to say. I can just reply to the ones that we studied the most. Mm -hmm. And the southwest of France is one of the most famous with the most of words because there are so many dictionaries. But if you go to Switzerland or to Belgium, they have a lot of dictionaries as well. And mm -hmm. when you look at this, you've, you just realize that, wow, there are so many words, so many expressions. I mean, the, one of the words that I encountered there was la drache. Uh, which I mean, it's quite onomatopoeic. I mean, it's it's up in it's it's from northern France, and it means la drache, as in to be showered on with a <laughs> quick belt of rain. And it just met, said to, spoke to me saying, "Oh, it's like getting you're drenched in English, la drache." And then, of course, you find the root verb back to Dutch, exactly, which is quite which is 
another part of low German, which is like English. So it's it's great to see these little connections. And um, in, well, let's say the mountain ranges up in Savoie in Switzerland, La Puff. And I mean, again, it's it's on a matter of peg. It's powdery snow. You can you can you can you can almost yeah. feel it. So it's quite interesting that these things. I mean, it's they they always link into something that is very local. Obviously, you get a lot of rain in the north, a lot of snow <laughs> in the east, but um, and also il fait cru, uh, as in it's raw. We say that in Ireland. Say God, it's a raw day out there. So it's 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 quite interesting as well that you can see the similarities between you know the dialects here in France and also you know, the expressions that we use in English. English, um, But looking into now the evolution of modern French, um, there's been a big polemic, a big debate about the feminization of the language, the introduction of what do you call it, the median stop or the median period um, to delineate or denotate feminine and masculine, but all in the same word. And of course, then it's the certain terms, the revision of certain terms that are looked at as being racist. Um, do you think that this is necessarily a good thing for the development of the language? It depends the way we use it. Mm. Some of the procedures that they are proposed, yeah, it's very good things that we don't use the, some words that are very racist or connoted. Mm -hmm. But in another way, we have to be very careful not to make the language more complicated because writing French is super difficult and uh, the orthographic, the grammar is quite difficult quite complicated. Mm. On the one way, on the one hand, we try to simplify some rules and some others, if you add more rules with this medium stop, yeah. or this might be more, com we are going to complexify the language and less people will have access to these rules. So we have to be careful. Have to be careful. And the other thing is when you see the median stops, it really seems to interrupt the flow of the language because what you're reading is not what you'll pronounce. It's, uh, it's something, it's almost abstract. You know, it's 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 very curious. Yeah, it's exactly. So, it's, and it depends as well the number of uh, median points or this uh, different stuff that you do in the writing. If you read a tweet, it's okay. If you read a full text and it's full of this, it will be very difficult yeah. to get. It's yeah. visually jarring you in the face. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, again, back to the whole idea of the academy, the protection of the French language. Um, you know, you have one side certain within the academy who think that French must be revered like a temple and it can't be touched like ancient Greek. This is, you know, this this beautiful thing that can never be touched. But again, you have others who say, well, the biggest threat, of course, you have Anglo-Saxon. You've got the uh, in infiltration of English. Rap music, the kids who are speaking the Verlon on the streets, they have had an impact on, uh, impact on French language. But also you've got the arrival of the internet and lexicon, business. So what is the biggest threat to the integrity of the French language? Globish, this weird internet English that is passing around the world? Is it the kids on the street? Or is it the people who are trying to defend us against any influence? Well, all these influences, and uh, some people wanted to protect, some people wanted the things to change, always are happens that's why French changed changed so much over the centuries so mm -hmm. now I don't think there is any th threat threaten on the on threats on the on the French language it will continue to take some words to the English if we look at what happened during the covid we didn't take that many words from English we were not saying lockdown mm -hmm. we're not saying uh, 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 reopen or pass we use some French words yes. compared with Italy what happened they were using many English words Oh, really? OK. And I mean, again, when you say we, we said uh, confinement rather than lockdown, etc. But why, for example, we're just talking about the Internet. Why did the web not become la toile? In French, some people use la toile, but yeah. it's because every most of the innovation come from uh, uh, English language. But if you look at the gastronomy now, you can see that most of the innovation or what we eat, they come from Japanese languages mm -hmm. like wasabi and uh, sushi, sashimi and all these things. And nobody is worried about this invasion of uh, Japanese language, but everybody's focusing on English, yeah. which is very weird. And uh, one final point uh, in our discussion today. Um, when looking at the importance of the French language on a world map, many people have said the saviour of the French language as a global language is Africa. 
What do you think of that because of the demographic? It depends. It depends what you call French and you have to be very careful to see which French they are really talking because in Africa, in the French-speaking uh, parts of Africa, mm -hmm. most of the people, f for most of the people, French is a second language or a third language. So I don't know if the future of uh, French is there. It might be still in France, unfortunately. Okay, Mathieu Avanzi, linguist, author and, uh, well, Professor at the Sorbonne and all things uh, that are French and the regional regions of France, thank you very much for being on the programme today. Thanks to you. And thank you very much for looking and tuning in to Paris Perspective. We'll be back in two weeks' time.